comfort. We come to worship you in spirit and in truth. We humbly pray that you would open our hearts to the preaching of your word, so that we may repent of our sins, believe in Jesus Christ as our only Savior, and grow in grace and holiness. Hear us for the sake of his name. Amen. We'll begin with the opening.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most but merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God, and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Continue with the next hymn.
Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins and shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations, and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, my soul shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The epistle is from 1 Thessalonians <clears throat> chapter 5. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We rise from the reading of the gospel. <laughs>
You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to tell you a story, a story that never happened. The mother of four young children was critically injured in an automobile accident. It took nearly three months in the hospital for healing to close her wounds and mend her many broken bones. During this time, the children were not allowed to visit their mother. Their only contact with her had been by telephone. Finally, finally the day came when the mother could return home. Her oldest daughter met her at the door with screams of delight. Mommy, you're home. After a moment, she said excitedly that the other children were in the backyard playing. She raced off to get them, but they did not come back. <clears throat> Finally, the father went to a window and looked out. All four of the youngsters were busy playing as if they didn't know their mother was home. The fact is, they didn't. Their sister had joined them in play without one word of the good news that mother was right in the house. I said this is a story that never happened because it could not have happened. Anyone who had such good news to tell, especially a child, would tell it. Good news is for telling. Christmas is such good news. The heart throb of the season is the wonderful message that God loved the world the sin-laden, troubled, dying world so much that he himself came into it to bring deliverance. Thus, Christmas is foretelling. It is just too good to hold back. It is the message that even the angels rejoice to tell. The shepherds couldn't hold it back when they saw the child in the manger. Our text today speaks of one of the greatest tellers of the good news of Christ's coming to save. In John the Baptist, we find a perfect example of how we too should be carriers of the good news. Truly, he was a witness sent from God. May the Holy Spirit empower us to copy his example because Christmas is foretelling. The telling of any message is reinforced when it is backed by a dependable authority. The strength of John's witness about Christ is expressed in the words of the text. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man had a divine commission for the task that finally became a life-consuming passion. Only the Lord Jesus himself came into the world with his life's work more laid out for him. The powerful preaching of John the Baptist was an essential part of God's great plan for delivering the world from the grasp of sin. It is no wonder then that Isaiah, commonly called the gospel writer of the Old Testament because of his beautiful, beautiful prophecies of Christ, also has many clear prophecies about the coming of John. In chapter 40 he writes, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Later, through the prophet Malachi, God told more specifically what John's task was to be. Behold, I send my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Even the birth of John was marked by special touches of God's hand to distinguish him as one specially sent. The angel Gabriel appeared to Zacharias, John's father, and told him that he would have a very special son, for he was to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. His birth was a miraculous one in that Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth were far beyond the age for having children. And remember how Zacharias couldn't speak until John was born and named? Because he doubted the angel's message. 
When his tongue was loosed and he began praising God, people were filled with amazement as they asked, What then will this child be? Today we can answer them and say that Jesus or John was the forerunner of Jesus, the Christ. He was to prepare people for the coming of Jesus so that they would accept him and take him into their hearts. Even before his birth, he was endowed with a great measure of the Holy Spirit to equip him for the trying task he faced. So great was this man John that Jesus said of him, Among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. In the second part of our text, John was asked who he was, and he didn't deny who he was. John wasn't looking for personal glory or attention or accolades. He didn't try to pretend to be something he wasn't, embellishing or magnifying himself, or his standing or his exploits as so to impress anyone. Think about it. If John cared about social standing and honor and prestige, he could easily have pointed to his family tree, and he would have been right in doing so. <clears throat> he was the son of a pretty important Israelite priest, the son of Zechariah. This meant that John was entitled to, and expected to be, a priest. He was entitled to, and expected to be a part of the high society, the elite, the cream of the Israelite crop. But John faithfully forsook all that, answering God's call to serve him in the way God intended. Living in the wilderness, wearing camel hair, eating honey and locusts. But not once did John name drop or point to his family tree or attempt to build himself up bigger than what he really was. When asked, he didn't deny the truth. How many of us can be accused of doing these things? He said, I am not the Christ, or Elijah, or a prophet. And he was so humble that he considered himself unworthy to untie a shoelace for Christ. His determined concern was, Christ must increase, but I must decrease. In a less spectacular, but nevertheless genuine way, every child of God has a commission from God to be a witness to his great love in Christ. The Apostle Peter puts it so well in his first epistle. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, that you may declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The emphasis is that we are God's people by choice, God's choice. Thus, Jesus reminded his disciples, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. According to his plan, determined in eternity, God brings to himself those he has chosen to be his special people. He bestows on them the added distinction of being priests with the privilege of serving him and having direct communication with him. Surely we have titles and a calling equal to or above John's. Now note well God's purpose in calling us to be his. We dare not close our eyes or turn off our minds so that we miss this ever so clear assignment. We are to bear fruit. And that fruit is giving witness to the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are to carry on the work Jesus came to start. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. We are God's messengers to this time and place in which we live to tell the people around us the good news about Christ. Oh, that each of us would accept our divine assignment in the spirit of John. He was willing to give anything and everything, even life itself, to tell the message he was sent to declare. Such was the spirit of a radiant Christian who lived in an African village. Although he was afflicted with a disease known as elephantiasis, which causes the skin to become thick and hard like an elephant's hide and produces enormous swelling, 
He was determined to tell every soul in his village the good news. Every day, he went from hut to hut to talk about Jesus. After several months, he had visited every hut in the village. Then he began to go to the people in a village two miles away, until all of them had been reached also. Before long, despite his affliction, he was determined to take Christ to a village over ten miles away. Against the wishes of his family, he slipped from his home early one morning and walked the painful miles to the distant village and began to visit every hut there. He was in a pitiful condition by the time he reached home. The missionary doctor who treated him was astounded at what the man had done. Later he said, All I could think of was the verse in the Word of God, How beautiful are the feet of them that bring good tidings, that publish peace. Now back to the example of John in our text. He was not only given a call to be the voice in the wilderness, but he had a divine message as well. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light. The identity of the light is given by the Gospel writer John just before the text, where he speaks of Jesus as the eternal Word. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. With the coming of the Word into the world, the light of life and hope was shining on people who before had existed in the darkness of sin and death. The sole all-pervading purpose of the life of John the Baptist was in the words of his father Zechariah at his birth. You, child, will go to prepare the way of the Lord, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. John would be the morning star announcing the arrival of the Son of Righteousness so long awaited. John's witness had a twofold thrust. First, he issued the call, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent literally means be changed. It was a call to people to turn from the way of sin that leads to death and open up to the power of God about to be revealed that would comfort wounded hearts and heal broken lives. In attempting to turn the people from their sin, John boldly and frankly exposed it. From the most common men to the king in his palace, when the highly vaunted Pharisees came to him, he called them a brood of vipers. He scolded the multitudes for being so selfish and loveless. He called the tax collectors to take only what was fairly due them. And the soldiers he told to stop their violence and their complaining. He made no bones about condemning the adulterous marriage of King Herod to his brother's wife. The result of his fearless preaching was that crowds of people came from all over Judah to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Then, when Jesus appeared on the scene, entering into his public ministry, John pointedly declared him to be the promised Messiah, whose way he had been sent to prepare. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Without the experience of living in those days, we miss some of the impact of John's testimony in pointing Jesus as the Christ. Everyone saw John as a great prophet of God. He had a tremendous following, so great that Herod was, to, was afraid to hurt him even after he had imprisoned him. Thus, when John turned people away from himself and directed them to Jesus, his witness carried commanding authority. Without, without question, our Lord expects all of his disciples to be witnesses to him as Lord and Savior. He could have sent angels to do the work. They know all about him, and in fact, did make the first announcement of his arrival in the world. But they lack the personal experience of being saved for them to be genuine witnesses for Christ. This is why the Lord has chosen to use people, his people, people who have tasted of the water of life, 
to share it with others. Thus, at his ascension into heaven, he told those who had been with him and knew what he had said and done, You shall be my witnesses. We also have a divine message we are to tell. It is the good news which the angel announced at Jesus' birth. Unto you is born a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. It is the good news which we ourselves have received by the working of the Holy Spirit. He has worked the faith in our hearts that moves us to call Jesus our Lord and Savior. As Paul declares in Romans, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Just think of it. We have that peace which the Prince of Peace brought to our world. We know God's love, have the assurance that death has been conquered, are comforted by His presence and promises, and already can lay claims to the inheritance of eternal life. But the Heavenly Father wants everyone to know Christ and have His peace. We must tell them. We are ambassadors for Christ, God making His appeal through us. Be reconciled to God. We need not be fiery creatures like John the Baptist, but our message should be the same. First, a call to repentance must be made. One of the hardest things in the world for anyone to do is face up to our sin. This means taking an honest look at ourselves. No sweeping the dirt under the rug. Expose sin for what it is. Only when a person wants to turn away from what he is can the promise of Jesus and salvation mean anything. This is true for you and for me also. Then we must give testimony to Christ as Savior. He alone and no one else. We cannot accept the empty excuse, I believe in God. The very message of Christmas is that Jesus is the Savior of men, the only Savior. It is in Him that God has delivered the world from its sins and given life in, its pla in their place. Christ alone is the way, the truth, and the life. He brings us to the Father in heaven. Christmas is a most natural time to witness to Christ. The message is already being spoken in many of the carols that we heard, that we hear, and in the decorations seen everywhere. We simply must focus people's attention on what is really being said. Jesus is not only the Savior, but their Savior. The purpose, is, the purpose of John's preaching was, he came for testimony to bear witness to the light, that all might believe through him. May that be our purpose for witnessing during the Christmas season just ahead. Let families share the joys of the Christ child with one another, along with the gifts they exchange. Let people around you know what really is at the heart of your Christmas. After all, you may be the only one in your office, your neighborhood, your school, yes, in your home, that is telling the good news of Christmas. And remember, Christmas is foretelling. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.